Have you heard about our brand new expert bike we're giving away? You know that crazy Honda with all the R's and a name like some legendary drop from a raid boss in World of Warcraft? In case you've had your head buried in the sand like an ostrich these last few days, we're giving away a brand new Honda CBR 1000 RR RSP Fireblade, and I'm never going to say that whole name ever again because it's way too many letters. Seriously, Honda, who came up with that designation? They really need to go back to the drawing board. But anyway, we wanted to take some time today and go over over what makes this thing absolutely insane. Yeah, you've got your R1Ms and your BMW S1000 RRMs and limited edition ZX10 RRs, but there's something about this new Fireblade that just oozes pedigree from every angle. There's also the only thing that it oozes because it's a Honda, which means all you need to do is change the oil and you're good to go. In order to figure out why this motorcycle is so damn awesome, we're going to give it the whole so you want a blank bike treatment, only today we're going to spend a bit more time on the history because it's the culmination of decades worth of championship winning motorcycles distilled into one package of supreme Honda excellence and awesomeness. Now, before we get too far, I need to remind you about our special offer we've got running through our store, YN Moto. We've got all kinds of riding gear, tools, tires, parts, and more. We've actually added some new items, so click the link down below and check it out. If you use the code FIREBLADE10, you'll get 10% off your whole order and double your entries to win this one-of-a-kind motorcycle. What could be better? You get a nice little deal on your parts for your motorcycle, which, let's be honest, you're probably going to pick up anyway because impulse control is not a strong thing for most motorcyclists, and on top of that, you're going to get extra entries to win. That's literally a win win right there. Remember, this is only available for a limited time, so you need to get on it. Once again, that is code FIREBLADE10 for 10% off your order and double entries to win. Okay, so let's begin at the beginning. That seems like a good place to start. Honda's history of racing dominance goes back decades, and it was really catapulted into the next generation with the NR line of bikes, or new racing. The most famous of which being the NR750, which was an oval piston V4 putting down 125 horsepower and 49 foot-pounds of torques. The bike was absolutely absolutely bonkers and it sold for a staggering $50,000 in early 90s money which in today's dollars is probably like a million because inflation is a nightmare. Because of its design, no one, not even Honda, wanted to work on the engine so they removed something for a bit more traditional, the inline 4. I could go on and on about the RVTs, the RVFs, and all sorts of other wildly successful race bikes, but to save us some time, I'll just say that Honda was whooping everyone's butt on race day. In 1992, Honda launched the first Fireblade, the CBR 900RR. The 900RR featured an 893cc engine that put down 122 horsepower and 65 foot-pounds of torque, which was every bit as potent as the NR750, but crucially, it didn't have 32 valves and normal human beings could service it. It weighed in at 454 pounds, it was pretty darn quick clearing the quarter mile in 10.3 seconds and topping out at 164 miles per hour. For the times, the suspension was surprisingly calm competent featuring 45mm Showa's up front with preload and rebound dampening as well as fully adjustable Showa shock in the back. It's got that classic 90s sport bike look as well with the red, white, and blue colorway, the two headlights up front, and the boxy tail. It might not be as sleek and sexy as a modern leader bike, but you can't deny it's a pretty awesome retro look. In 1996, they bored out the engine to 919ccs, a wider carb and a slightly more relaxed riding position. It's worth pointing out that at this point in history, motorcycle manufacturers weren't really making race bikes with lights like they do nowadays. They did have some wild and crazy bikes, but the flagship street sport bikes were really just about flexing on your buddies, not running around a track chasing lap times. The extra 26 cubes added 8 horsepower and 3 foot-pounds of torque, which is sort of meh for a generational update. It was also still carbureted, so if you want to buy the wrong fire blade and hate yourself at the same time, this is your bike. The best version of the 919 engine can be found in the CB900F or the Hornet or the 919 because even in the early 2000s, Honda had a penchant for stupidly long names. It was a more modern fuel-injected naked bike that made for some awesome classic inline four sounds and crucially didn't require to rejet and resync four carbs if you decided to do an exhaust swap. In 2000, Honda bored the CBR out again, going up to 929ccs and a more over-square design, which means that the engine was more bore than stroke. Why does that help? Well, it means you can rev out farther, reaching higher horsepower at even higher RPMs. How much did that improve the power? 
lots. The 929 jumped to 152 horsepower and 76 foot-pounds of torques. It was also the first fuel-injected CBR 1000, and you can start seeing the slow creep of racing tech for street bikes. It featured a titanium exhaust, larger rotors, an upside-down fork, and a 17-inch wheel, which was the new standard for sport bikes. A whole two years later, the CBR was bored out for the third time to 954 cc's. Unlike the 929, it didn't see a massive power bump. In fact, you'd barely notice this was only putting down two more ponies and one torque less. What they really focused on with this motorcycle was improving the stuff around the engine and reducing the weight. It tipped the scales at 430 pounds but had a bigger radiator, bigger fuel injection, tougher frames and swing arms and higher pegs for that sick lean angle. This was the last of Honda's chilled out leader bike. After this point, it was all race bikes with headlights, but this generation did start a pattern that you can see throughout the CBR line, where Honda makes one generation with the massive engine update and the less refined frame and engine, and then the next generation fixes all the stuff that was wrong with the rest of the motorcycle. For example, in 2004, they released the CBR 1000 RR with a massive bump in displacement up to 998 cc's and 172 horsepower. But while the engine improved by leaps and bounds, the rest of the bike was just good enough. In 2006, they released an update with a few engine tweaks, but with the new chassis, new exhaust, new brake setup, lighter weight materials, different final drive gearing, and an adjusted suspension. Once again in 08, we saw an increase in power up to almost 180 horsepower, but it wasn't until the next year that we started to see nannies being helped to add and manage that power and make it more usable. It went on like this for a few years until 2014 when we saw the first iteration of the CBR 1000 RR SP, which was a limited run homologation race bike meant for the 1% of riders to use as a track weapon. It had Olin suspension, Brembo monoblocks, refined engine mapping, and a $2,700 premium over the base model. It wasn't really a GP bike for the street because Honda was literally working on that in the background at the time with the RC213 VS, which was a $180,000 toy for Saudi oil princes to put in their penthouses. Throughout the rest of the 20 teens, we saw a collection of tweaks and improvements to the CBR culminating in the current 2021 CBR 1000 RR, putting down 189 horsepower and 84 foot-pounds of Torgos, with rider modes, TFT dashboards, adjustable nannies, and unlike a lot of other Hondas, a $16,949 price tag. But as if to torpedo their own motorcycle, Honda unveiled the CBR 1000 RR RSP Fireblade, which immediately suplexed every other Japanese leader bike overnight. Unlike the previous SP version, it was not the same engine as the RR packed into a nicer package. The modern Fireblade has the exact same bore and stroke as the GP machine, massively revised internal to withstand all its power it's making, which in case you missed it, is 215 horsepower and 83 foot-pounds of torques. People are claiming that the US bike is limited to 189 horsepower, but I can tell you from experience that it feels like a lot more than that. Oh, not to mention, the bike has a top-of-the-line Olin's NPX electronically adjustable four with an integrated gas canister which you'll only find on the best of the best, and a Kropovich exhaust system from the factory, and winglets so you can get that downforce when you do late night pulls on the highway. As far as tech is concerned, it's got a very obtuse menu setup, but you can enable, disable, and basically adjust everything on the bike. You want to ride it with all the power and none of the nannies because you ain't no wuss and you want to handle the power? You can't. You want to ride it like a super uncomfortable scooter around town? Slap it in rain mode and never leave first gear. Also, it's a small thing, but the TFT dash is also completely customizable with a whole bunch of different layouts and setups so you can see exactly what you want to see. It'll cost you a pretty penny starting at $28,500, which means you're not going to get it out the door for under $30,000. There's only one exhaust option for you, and it's a $4,000 Acra racing system, which is supposed to add between 15 and 20 horsepower because two 15 just isn't enough. We're just going to say that the right fire blade with all the toys is probably close to $35,000, which is basically down payment on a house money. But if you're planning on lighting that much cash on fire to buy a midlife crisis mobile to prove to yourself that you're still a virile adult human, what other bikes are out there? Well, the world of expensive leader bikes is replete with special editions, but there's only a handful that I'd say really compete with the fire blade. The R1M is just a carbon fiber R1 with a fancy app and electronic suspension. It's not a super limited edition motorcycle, it's basically just a holographic version of the R1. The same can be said for the ZX10 RR. First of all, Cowie doesn't have any GP tech because they don't compete in GP because they're scared or they can't afford it or whatever. It's got the same dashboard as a Ninja 650, the engine is only slightly improved over the ZX10, and cruise control and optional heated grips. 
Now, both the R1M and ZX10 RR are better street motorcycles due to the way that they're tuned. To really feel everything that the Fireblade has to offer, you basically need to rev it out all the way to 14,500 RPM like it's a dang R6. Whereas these other leader bikes are tuned for streetable power, which is weird to think when you realize we're talking about 200 plus horsepower leader bikes. You've also got the Jixxer 1000 RR, but Grandpa Suzuki would rather sell a whole bunch of tiny cars in Asia than make cool leader bikes, so they just slapped an XR livery on the bike and called it a day. No, unfortunately, there's really only one motorcycle you consider in competition with the Fireblade, and that's the Ducati V4R, a homologation race bike with the 998cc V4 capable of a sphincter tightening 221 horsepower and 83 foot pounds of Torgos. By the way, have you ever noticed how all these bikes seem to cap out at 83 foot pounds? Kind of funny. Anyway, the Ducati costs an absolutely eye-watering $47,000 for this bike. I mean, yeah, you could get the base model, but come on, you're buying the motorcycle equivalent of a Mercedes AMG here. Are you seriously not going to get the full Zoot one? What are you planning to install the full system yourself and save on the labor? Of course not. I never thought I'd save this, but the Fireblade is the more affordable option, and it's making similar power figures, and it's the new hotness. Sure, the Ducati is a Ducati, but everyone already collectively shot their loads over the V4R a few years ago, and they're on to the latest and greatest, which is the Fireblade. Unless you're a Euro simp seeking to achieve your final form, I'd say skip the Ducati and get the Blade. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if you're cross shopping for both of these bikes, you can probably afford both. Now, how about reliability? It's a Honda, right? So you should just have to change the oil every 6,000 miles and you're good to go, right? Nope. This thing is in such an intense state of tune that you really need to be on top of maintaining it. Mercifully, it's just an inline four, which is a pretty cheap power plant to maintain, but you're still looking at some pretty hefty bills unless you start wanting to working on yourself, which would be a crime against humanity. Honestly, it feels like the only proper way to service the bike is to take it back to the factory and have them work on it in a clean room while wearing a hazmat suit so as to not get a single skin flick in the engine. Can you imagine popping and breaking a push pin on this thing? No. All that being said, it is still a Honda, so if you stay on top of the maintenance, you should be just fine. God, the thought of someone leaving a fire blade outside and never changing the oil gives me a bum tum. I gotta go take a spin on the blade really quick to cleanse myself of that cursed image. Fact. Unconsciously, native English speakers say adjectives preceding nouns in a specific order. Opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin, material, and purpose. It's why saying old green metal chairs sounds normal, but metal green old chairs sounds weird. Goodbye. Wow, look how pretty this is. You know what else is pretty? My beautiful face and this next Yammy Noob video. Click it right over here and check it out for yourself. There's fun memes in it, maybe Hayabusa's, maybe some cool stuff. There's only one way to find out. Click that video. Do it now.